Ladies and gentlemen, it, it's my great pleasure to in introduce um, yet another good friend of mine after introducing Alex Boot. I didn't know I had so many friends, but <laughs> Anthony Daniels. And to cover up the issue even further, Anthony and uh, Alex are also very good friends. So you will begin to think that this is looking a bit like a conspiracy. <laughs> but um, I'm really uh, honored uh, to have been invited to uh, introduce here the first of the Gillian Becker um, lectures, which Anthony is, is going to give. Uh, Gillian is having a, a hip operation at present, um, and she is a, a famous atheist. And uh, I think Tony is um, perhaps a rather less famous atheist so I, 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 I really am delighted with this ecumenical occasion that, that <laughs> I, as a Catholic priest, can, can introduce these two uh, uh, wonderful uh, atheistic people. Uh, I told Gillian that I was praying for her over her hip operation, and she said, thank you very much. Now, it's mentioned in the biography that I have in front of me of, of Gillian that she was a friend of, of, of Tony Flew's. Oh, it says in this thing, it must be written by the, the, the Militant Atheist Society, it says that, that, uh, that Tony Flew, Flew was also an atheist. Yeah, I know he was, but Tony Flew uh, not only gave up this foolish business, but he actually came and preached at my church of St. Michael's in Cornhill. Tony ought to need no introduction because he is a very illustrious fellow indeed and he writes many highly amusing and popular articles and books apart from his scholarly work which is very deep and productive. I should just tell you, um, I have to read it because I, I don't know the history in, in, in exactitude but um, Tony is a, is a very old friend of Gillian's he is now retired doctor and psychiatrist, and he worked for many years in a prison and general hospital, writing a weekly column for 14 years in The Spectator. He also wrote a weekly column in the British Medical Journal about medicine and literature. He's written a number of books, the latest being The Knife Went In. He sounds more like Alex than... than, than <laughs> which is his memoir of his time in prison, so to speak, and The Proper Procedure, a book of short stories. He has three books coming out this year. So what more can I say? What more should I say? Over to you, Tony. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been informed that there will be no questions after my lecture, so you will just have to accept that I am speaking the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, I hope that it's unnecessary for me to say what an honor it is to have been chosen to give the first Gillian Becker lecture. Gillian Becker was first a distinguished novelist. She's actually of South African origin. And one of her novels was reissued as a Penguin modern classic uh, recently. Uh, she then researched and wrote a book about the Bader-Meinhof uh, gang, Hitler's children, uh, that made her world famous, in fact. And demand for which was, uh, for some considerable time, so great around the world that apparently the printers had difficulty uh, keeping up with it. And thereafter, uh, she founded the Institute for the Study of Terrorism, a subject on which she became an acknowledged expert uh, with a prescient insight into the baleful influence the phenomenon of terrorism would have for the peace of the world and for the freedom of citizens. And after the downfall of the Soviet Union, she thought that uh, terrorism was not ended, but her funders apparently thought otherwise. She has remained a redoubtable defender of freedom ever since. If I may be uh, permitted to reminisce a little, 
in personal vein. Uh, Gillian was the first uh, distinguished writer with whom I ever struck up a friendship. At the time, I was unknown even to the small extent that I am now known. But Gillian was the kind of person who, despite her world fame, was unimpressed by the so-called importance or unimportance of people. This, as I subsequently discovered, was not very common among successful writers <clears throat> who in any social gathering were a little like uh, Mrs. Todgers, um, but instead of affection beaming out of one eye and calculation out of the other, um, she, uh, the uh, literary people, had um, boredom at least when I was speaking to them, beaming out of one eye, and surveillance of the room for someone uh, more important uh, beaming out of the other. The importance being gathered, uh, being uh, estimated by how much they could further their careers. Well, Gillian was never like that. She was neither dazzled by fame nor put off by its absence. And I must say that uh, I enjoyed her entertaining and assiduous commentary on the celebrated figures whom she had known, um, but who shall be nameless, at least, at least until we go off and have a drink. Uh, the subject of my talk today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is threats to freedom. And I'm not going to try to define freedom, either politically or metaphysically, on the assumption that Though we may differ somewhat on minor points of doctrine, we all know more or less what it is to be free and what it is to be unfree. Uh, in other words, I'm cont content to take the Johnsonian kicking the table leg approach to questions of definition. Uh, we, as you famously uh, said, we know our will's free and there's an end on it. I think it's true to say that most people here today would subscribe to the idea uh, that freedom is under attack from many different directions. Uh, but I propose to deal uh, with threats to only one aspect of freedom, that of expression. Uh, this is not to say that I believe that other aspects of freedom to be unimportant, only that uh, the life of man being about 70 years and the length of a lecture before everyone falls asleep being about 40 minutes, I have no time for anything else. <laughs> well, let me recount a couple of anecdotes relating to myself, uh, but which I hope reveal something about the temper of our times. Everyone, I imagine, likes to suppose that at least some of his experiences are of some wider than mere personal significance. And I think that this is so of the two experiences that I'm about to relate. The first was a call I received from the Irish State Broadcasting uh, Service. They were making a program about the sudden recent prominence of the phenomenon of transsexualism. And they were having great difficulty in finding anyone uh, willing to appear who took a view of it other than that it was a tremendous and indeed glorious uh, social advance. A liberation after centuries of oppression. Now they'd found plenty of people who did not believe this, uh, but none who was willing to say it or give his reasons in public. As it happens, this isn't a subject uh, that had caught my interest. At best, it was yet another of those dull subjects that seem to me to be increasingly common, namely those that are not worth thinking about, but yet somehow force themselves upon our attention. I was reluctant to take part in the program for more than one reason. Uh, the first being that I detest television, and I'm not very good at it. And my experience of television people is that they edit what you say in such a way as to make you appear ridiculous if they don't like what you are saying. But honesty compels me to admit also I was reluctant uh, because of what I thought might happen if I spoke my mind. I said to the producers that surely they could find someone better qualified than I to speak, but that was really... Uh, a bit of an excuse. Uh, 
I had noticed, for example, that between 2013, when the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association was published, and 2017, when an article on the subject was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the supposed prevalence of the desire to be transsexual had increased by over 70 times. An increase, incidentally, that the New England Journal either failed to notice, thought was too unimportant to mention, or was too cowardly to comment upon. Now, obviously, several possible explanations for this increase uh, spring to mind, and I ha need hardly enumerate them. But I have a feeling, this is my personal feeling, that in order to explain it, an examination of the history of uh, Dior or Balenciaga might be more illuminating uh, than a, an examination of biology. Both symptoms and diagnoses are subject to fashion. And it is not long since the, that uh, conditions or supposed conditions such as multiple personality or repressed memory were very much more common, and I almost said fashionable, than they are now. Where symptoms are unaccompanied by biological markers, they are obviously susceptible to social, psychological, and cultural pressure as well as, of course, incentives, all of which would affect their prevalence in a given population. I could not, of course, prove that this accounts, uh, accounted for the increase to which I have alluded, but it seemed to me likely, and I made a prediction, uh, namely that the current hoo-ha or ideological circus would before long um, uh, attach itself and uh, to something else. It would move on. The whole circus would move on. After which, there would be lawsuits uh, of children against doctors, psychologists, and even parents. Of the making of hoo-hahs, there is no end. And for many people, the making of hoo-hahs are what, given, uh, what gives meaning to their lives, and the interesting question to me is, what will it be next? I, I, if I had to put my money anywhere, I would say it was necrophilia. <laughs> well, if uh, a hoo-ha comes, can litigation be far behind? However, I was reluctant to say any of this on public television, uh, public television is broadcast now around the world almost instantaneously. In the end, the producers of the program prevailed on me to appear, appealing to the argument that if no one spoke, uh, liberty would die. But even so, uh, when I did appear, I was not as forthright as I might otherwise have been. What was I afraid of? I knew from experience how vicious and unscrupulous pressure groups could be when crossed and when their opinion of their, the subject, their chosen subject, is contradicted. Back in the 1990s, I wrote an article about what is sometimes called myalgic encephalomyelitis, or more usually nowadays, chronic fatigue syndrome. In this condition, or pattern of behavior, people suffer prolonged exhaustion, uh, not much relieved by rest and worsened by physical effort. And it can last for years and indeed for lifetimes, at least where there is a system of social security. <laughs> there has been a long dispute as to whether CS CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, is principally of physical or psychological origin. The people who have it almost all prefer the physical explanation, and their pressure groups have almost succeeded in silencing anyone who argues differently. And bear in mind, this is not a question of who is correct. I wrote an article about 20 years ago 
which admittedly was not emollient in tone, supporting the psychological or social origin of uh, CF CFS, and immediately found myself the object of a degree of persecutory telephone calls at all hours, and even attempts to have me sacked from the hospital in which I was work, uh, working. No other article, as far as I know, of mine has ever been brought to the attention of a government minister but this one was by the people who are normally uh, very tired. <laughs> well, I quickly learned uh, what subsequently uh, I discovered uh, other journalists and even scientific uh, investigators, much more scientific than I, had learned. Uh, namely, that this was a subject that was best avoided, and it has been more or less avoided for quite a number of years, except insofar as the, the, uh, the view uh, that it is a physical disease uh, is promoted. I'm glad to say that when the director of my hospital was written to with a request that I should be dismissed from my job, he replied robustly. It's a free country, he said, and he can write what he likes. But I'm far from convinced that any person in authority, only 20 years later, would write in so muscular a fashion. Now, what this illustrates, I think, is the asymmetrical warfare that can exist between pressure groups and others, however numerous the others may be. The fact is, or perhaps I should say more modestly, my impression is that there are ever more monomaniacs in the world, uh, ever more since the downfall of the Soviet Union, in fact, as an ideological state, uh, because its ideology, as it were, acted as a lightning conductor for the monomaniacs of the world. The new monomaniacs attach their monomania uh, to several different things, and some of them are serial monomaniacs. Um, they may attach uh, their monomania to one subject and then follow it up with a, uh, a change to another subject. And some uh, are monomaniacs for their, the whole of their lives. But at any rate, their subject, the subject of their monomania, is all important to them but to other people, I don't think I'm a monomaniac, uh, it's only one thing amongst others. This being the case, the monomaniacs enjoy an enormous advantage over their opponents. Their subject is all in all to them, and they are prepared to sacrifice their lives. Uh, their sacrifice, incidentally, is a great pleasure to them, uh, to this subject, to their subject. While other people are not prepared to sacrifice much to oppose them, because life is too short and full of other things more important and more interesting. This is the way that new orthodoxies or new parties are made, and other views become not merely mistaken, but his heretical. Punishment, rather than disagreement, becomes the order of the day. It is seldom, as Hume tells us, that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. So that while we do not fear the midnight knock on the door, at least I don't fear the midnight knock on the door, yet we may feel or actually be less free than we were or we felt only a few years ago. My second experience is more recent at a small literary festival in the town of Lewis in Sussex. I was the penultimate speaker, and my appearance attracted no particular uh, notice, at least if the subsequent sales of the book of mine that I was promoting are anything to go by. <laughs> but I was to be followed as the last speaker at the festival by Katie Hopkins, uh, 
a controversial journalist, of whom I, I am, being so divorced from uh, contemporary national life, I had hardly heard. I didn't know who she was. But the organizer of the festival warned me, however, that there might be trouble because of her appearance at the festival. As I discovered, I looked her up, of course, um, she has said some very inflammatory things in the past and things that, in my opinion, she should not have said, even if her excuse were that she said them only because there has been so much censorship and self-censorship in the recent past about so many subjects. Two wrongs don't make a right. Thus, it was wrong to use the expression, we need a final solution after the Manchester bombing. And the fact that a Labour Party parliamentary group, which includes Mr. Corbyn, used the expression, our solution of the Palestine question will be the final solution, some months later, does not make what Katie Hopkins said any the better. But criticism of someone, however justified, is not a reason for denying his or her right to speak in public if invited to do so. What happened at Lewis was that by means of premeditated violence and intimidation, she was prevented from speaking uh, by demonstrators who had given notice that they intended to disrupt and, if possible, uh, destroy the meeting. According to reports, some of the demonstrators furnished children with eggs to throw at the police, um, who did little enough in all conscience to protect people who were peacefully going about their lawful business. There is no doubt that citizens were frightened and intimidated by a howling mob, a small mob, but a mob nevertheless, members of which indubitably broke the law. Innocent people were in effect imprisoned in the hall in which Katie Hopkins was to speak, for the police advised them that they would not be safe if they left. They couldn't guarantee their safety. One of the most enthusiastic members of the mob actually broke into the hall by use of an iron bar and injured someone quite badly. Eventually, Katie Hopkins was advised by the police to leave, clandestinely, of course, because they said they could not guarantee her safety. And I think that if the mob had actually got hold of her, she might well have been seriously injured or even killed. Those trapped in the hall, it was a deconsecrated church, um, and my wife and I were among them, were eventually escorted by the police out of the back entrance through a muddy churchyard cemetery in the complete, incomplete darkness. At a subsequent uh, literary festival, I must admit, I rather missed the excitement. I said, this can't be a literary festival if there is no riot. Now, the curious thing that was that this was the nearest thing to fascist thuggery that I have ever witnessed in Britain, though the participants in it claimed to be fighting hatred and intolerance in general, and fascism in particular, as instantiated by Katie Hopkins. Before the event, one of the organizers of the demonstrators said, I'm all for free speech, but Katie Hopkins just says provocative and offensive things to further her own career. I'm not supporting that under any circumstances. Now, this opinion was quoted in the local newspaper, and it is worth, I think, a little reflection as being emblematic, I think, of a certain common and commonplace way of thinking in contemporary society. No doubt the person who said this to the newspaper would deny that what she said was a justification for the violence that ensued, but having called for Katie Hopkins not to be allowed to speak, she could hardly have been surprised when, the call having been ignored, people who think in her fashion took the law into their own hands. It is surely the case that almost anything of any import is capable of offending someone. After all, people often grow agitated in disputes 
over academic arcana, to say nothing of anger over even more trivial matters. To make offensiveness the criterion of permissibility of speech, therefore, is either to reduce us all to utter blandness in our pronouncements or to accord protection to some favored groups of people but not to others, the selection of those deemed worthy of such protection being itself a further cause of dispute, aggravation, and, of course, of taking offense. Let's linger for a little while about the psychology of taking offense. There are, no doubt, insulting ways of speaking speaking against which most of us would take offense, and the law actually recognizes that. It is not with these kinds of uh, expressions that I am concerned. It is offense taken against opinions to which I wish to draw attention. For those who think <coughs> that offensive weapon, uh, opinions should be suppressed, and if not prohibited by law, prevented by force from being expressed anywhere, offense has two aspects. First, it is a kind of natural phenomenon, as an earthquake or an eruption of a volcano. That is to say, an inevitable reaction to something that is said. Second, the offense confers on the person taking it a moral authority, provided, of course, that the person who takes it belongs to a group supposedly entitled to protection against offensive utterance. Taking offense becomes a pleasure, a duty, a habit, a hobby, a raison d'etre. In current circumstances, perhaps, the most prominent group of persons claiming such protection, though very far from being the only one, are Muslims. They, or at least many of them, claim that the person of their prophet and their holy book should be immune from normal criticism, though both are by any rational standards uh, very easily criticized. Here let me add by, uh, that by this I do not want to imply that even if, as is impossible, they were above criticism in the ordinary sense, that they were in fact perfect they would still not be above permissible um, criticism. One of the reasons that Muslims claim their prophets and their holy books immunity from criticism is that it is of such importance to them, these holy things are so important to them, that they feel very deeply hurt, even mortally wounded, when they are subject to to criticism or mockery. The subsequent violence of their reaction when it occurs is akin for them to the violence of self-defense. And I've heard a Muslim, as far from a fanatic as possible, and a very reasonable person, say this in defense of his view that the prophet should be above criticism. Everything else was permissible but not that. Here, of, co of course, those who think like this set themselves up as the sole judges of offensiveness. Something is offensive to them if they say it is, and of course, if something is offensive to them, they can only be offended by it. Moreover, if something offends them greatly, they can only be offended by it greatly, and the violence of their manifestation of offense is taken as proof of just how offensive the thing was in the first place. In other words, they present themselves as automata in the grip of passions they can neither control nor be asked or expected to control. As I've already hinted, this is the type of thinking and feeling that has become, or at least it seems to me to have become, prominent in our society over the last two or three decades. And let me just outline a few of the psychological characteristics again of taking offense, outrage and indignation. They are pleasurable, rewarding, and unlike most pleasures and rewards, uh, potentially long-lasting. You can be resentful for the whole of your life. Resentment is the most reliable of all human emotions. 
they prevent one from having to examine oneself, which is always a painful thing to do, honestly, and always transfer opprobrium and blame onto others. Most people, when they are offended, outraged, or indignant, believe themselves to be not only in the right, but generous and good. I'm outraged, therefore I'm good, is the modern moral equivalent of Descartes' cogitatio. Here let me add briefly another reason for the current epidemic, as I see it, of the kind of willing and unself-controlled outrage that fosters the urge and the demand for the suppression of the opinion of others, namely that virtue is nowadays believed to be, or at any rate people believe, uh, act as if they believed it to be, principally a matter of opinion and not of conduct. Virtue is a, a purely conceptual matter rather than a discipline. It is not, as it were, to help an old lady across the road, but to opine that old ladies should be helped across the road. After all, if you help an old lady across the road, you have merely helped one old lady across the road. Uh, road. But if you say that old ladies should be helped across the road, you have added to the likelihood that among the many millions of people uh, who hear you and the many millions of old ladies who want to cross the road, some of them will be helped and therefore you would have done more than by actually helping an old lady across the road. <laughs> well, after this uh, digression, I return to the statement made to the local newspaper by the organizer of the protest against Katie Hopkins' appearance in Lewis. Katie Hopkins just says provocative and offensive things to further her own career. And she gave this as one of her reasons for trying to prevent Hopkins from speaking. Now let me make it quite clear that I do not object to the ascription of motives to Katie Hopkins, whether in this case the motives uh, ascribed are right or wrong. It seems to me that being human, we cannot possibly refrain from ascribing uh, motives to one another, and I certainly <laughs> ascribe motives to people. For example, I have no hesitation in ascribing to many persons who make philanthropic declarations a liberal admixture of sadism, for often their uh, proposals would entail, if put into, uh, in, into practice, distant benefit but proximate infliction of pain. And I think that they know this perfectly well. But speculations about the motives of opinions and for the desire to express them in public are usually just that, speculations. Moreover, motives, as proper self-examination should surely tell us all, are like truth, rarely pure and never simple. To take the case of Katie Hopkins, it is perfectly possible that she should wish to advance her career, as which of us has never desired to do, but also that every opinion that she utters is sincerely held. The desire for self-advancement and sincerity of opinion are not polar opposites, and indeed can rule a mind in a kind of condominium. What is objectionable here is the desire to suppress opinion on the basis of speculations on the motives of him who puts them forward. This is a manifestation of the baleful and irrationalist tendency to consider not the truth of what someone says, but his motives for saying it. The outcome of what Paul Ricoeur called the hermeneutics of suspicion, whose masters were Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Needless to say, this suspicion is applied only to those opinions or statements with which the suspicious person disagrees or finds disagreeable. Lurking behind an unwelcome fact cited by an opponent, there always lies a slippery slope that usually leads to Hitler or Nazism. And this suspicion is sufficient to justify denying freedom to the suspect person to express his opinion. <laughs> 
And for the organizer of the, uh, the, the attempt to prevent Katie Hopkins from speaking, her suspicion that Hopkins was a careerist who did not really believe in the truth of what she said um, was a good enough reason to shut her up, at least in Lewis. Incidentally, in some of the local commentary on this episode, those who agreed with the attempts, ultimately successful as it happened, to prevent her from speaking, used the argument that if she were uh, to be allowed to speak, there would be public disorder. This, of course, amounts to blackmail, since the same people issuing the warning were those who proposed to carry out what they warned against. This is the logic, technique, or tactic that Muslims and many other protesters now use. It is morally repellent, at least to me, and of course, deeply harmful to freedom of expression. Let me move on now to the statement of the organizer of the attempt at, um, to prevent Katie Hopkins from speaking. Namely, that I'm not supporting her in any circumstances. That, of course, is her perfect right, although it is a right that I suspect she would deny others in the world that she would like to create or see, in which it would not be enough to refrain merely from criticizing official doctrine, it would be necessary to show positive adherence to that doctrine and positive support for it. The moral grandiosity or self-importance of the way in which the organizer put her opinion uh, hardly requires emphasis. But surely all that is required not to support someone like her is not to attend her talk. She was in fact promoting a book that she just published, a memoir. Or not to read her writings and not to buy her book. It is as if the supporter of a football a team were to prevent all other football teams from playing on the grounds that he did not support them. I suspect that a disconcertingly large proportion of young people at our universities now would not see how absurd, let alone how reprehensible this is, or indeed how much of a threat to their own freedom it will ultimately prove to be. Well, I hope, ladies and gentlemen, I've uh, uh, persuaded you that my little experience in Lewis, which was that of my wife as well, was not entirely without some wider significance. And so saying, I think it is time to draw some general conclusions uh, to provide what the Americans call a take-home message, though perhaps, I hope in this instance, it is a take-saloon bar message. Uh, and that would be more appropriate. The first is that there's a peculiar paradox of our time, namely that while it has never been easier for people to express their opinions anonymously, it is becoming more difficult or hazardous for them to express opinions which diverge from a very narrow range of approved opinion in public. The second is that threats to freedom of expression do not come nowadays principally or totally, from government, except where governments give in, as they increasingly do, to monomaniacal pressure groups with claims of special vulnerability for themselves, the better to achieve power over society or to extract some sectional advantage from it. The third is that no one really is in favor of freedom of expression unless he supports that same freedom for those he reprehends or even abominates. Finally, if I, am, I may be allowed a pessimistic note that I happen to know coincides with the view of the person for whom this lecture is named, I do not think, though I hope very much that I'm mistaken, that the prospects for freedom are very good. I think the weasels will soon take over Toad Hall. Uh, for a time, if not for good. Thank you very much.
is this mic still working? Yep. Um, Tony, I, that was absolutely magnificent. And um, I think um, I know that Gillian will be thrilled uh, about that. And, uh, and uh, just to remind you again, Gillian's had an operation today. And uh, um, she's been so helpful uh, to me in arranging this lecture and suggesting that Tony give it a, a great move on her part. Uh, and um, you, you haven't let us down. And uh, I, um, if I um, may, I, I, I think that Tony has really raised uh, this our whole gathering to a new level. Uh, and the issues that he has raised are absolutely fundamental to what the Freedom Association is all about. Uh, and. Uh, if I, if I may only, well, not so much take issue, but maybe, but well, no, I think he has challenged us in a way with his pessimistic end, um, and I suspect he is right, but we have a, a record of tackling um, difficult issues. Uh, it's what we are about, uh, and I certainly remember when we set up our Better Off Out campaign to leave the European Union in 2006. Uh, people saying, you know, that's a waste of time. You're tilting at windmills. It cannot be done. Uh, and uh, uh, so I suspect, I'm afraid, that Tony is right on this one, but we're going to give it a good go. Uh, and I know that my colleague, Andrew Allison, was a, a, a appalled uh, at, those, uh, at what went on in Lewis, uh, uh, as Tony quite correctly said, fascist, uh, fascist thuggery. Uh, and uh, so um, it's something that uh, I know Andrew sort of is on the radio, you know, almost every every day, almost every week, defending people, um, saying things which we often um, very strongly uh, object to. Um, and so this is absolutely fundamental. And I want to say we have plans uh, starting um, st starting next month, particularly to go into the universities. Um, because, as Tony rightly said, a disconcertingly high proportion of students don't seem to get this. So that, we, we, so that is going to be our main aim over the next year and coming years. It's a, it's a big battle. But ladies and gentlemen, please would you give Tony a really, really big round of applause for an absolutely magnificent lecture. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Uh, now, uh, you, uh, unfortunately, um, in between the drinks, which I know you're all waiting for, um, you have to put up with my sort of final sort of mini Oscar speech uh, at the end of our gathering uh, here this weekend. Uh, and uh, I just want to say so, some very brief thank yous um, here um, but to everybody involved. Obviously, the hotel staff, I think, have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, and uh, to, um, to my um, colleagues, our, our, our little team, uh, Andrew uh, and uh, Rory, where's Rory? Um, there aren't, anyway, I'd like to thank um, them. I'd like to thank uh, our chairman, Sir Mark. Uh, Sir Mark Wellington, who's been sort of my eyes and ears um, this weekend, uh, and all of our marvellous speakers. I deliberately had a theme for this, uh, for this weekend, um, which was we were still talking about uh, women of conviction. Uh, in the 100th anniversary of, uh, of, of female suffrage. Uh, and uh, we started, um, for that reason, with um, Sir Mark and I talking about Margaret Thatcher. Um, and because I mentioned then that Sir Mark and I actually were both that bastion of uh, free speech, King's College London, uh, which I, I'm, I'm rather ashamed to admit these days. Um, so we start off with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and then early on this morning, and I'm sure um, many of you will remember for a long time, uh, we, we, had, we had the privilege of having Caroline Cox uh, here, the most amazing lady. Uh, and we finish uh, this time uh, with Tony's um, brilliant lecture, um, uh, say, paying tribute to, to Gillian Becker, a most marvellous lady who's been so helpful to this, and so, um, so I'm so grateful to her. But that's our theme. Uh, and we're not into tokenism in the Freedom Association. Um, so, you know, we didn't have to try, try and have, you know, sort of equal number of male and female um, speakers. Uh, but um, but it's, it's an issue of importance. Uh, and uh, finally, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to thank uh, you for being a really... Uh, tremendously good audience and uh, I know when tends to say this but I really do mean it this time you've you, you've been very courteous uh, you you've been full of interest 
Uh, you, you've, you, you've asked good questions. You've occasionally got a little bit uh, excited, a bit, <laughs> uh, which is as it should be. Uh, uh, you've been absolutely tremendous, and uh, I'm most grateful to you all for coming along here and helping make this uh, an event where we celebrate freedom of expression. And as I say, we're going to go into battle over the years to come to try to take on the attacks on free, free speech. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and now offer a drink. Thank you. Thank you.